voluntary. It's not really what we're talking about here. It's not really what the ancient world had to do with. Uh, ancient slaves were allowed to have money and allowed to have families. And here you can see they just walk out free. This is different than kind of what we're used to. So we need to get that idea out of our mind and uh, think about it in a little bit of a different way. But what this text says is they can't go out with the wife and children they had while they're slaves. So you can see how that would otherwise lead to slaves you know, getting married really quickly because, hey, I can leave with, with this guy when he leaves. His time is almost up. And so you know, we kind of get out of our predicament pretty easily. So instead... There is a situation that's described here. Look at verse 5 with me. In verse 5 it says, But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. So this man is free. His time is up. He served his time. But he doesn't want to go. So he says, instead, he turns around and declares, I will not go free. I want to stay here with my master and my wife and my children. Verse 6 says, then his master shall bring him to God, he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. So, he bores the ear through, and he will be a permanent slave. So the question is, why would anyone ever choose to be a slave? And you see what the mindset of someone who chooses slavery is. He has the ability to go free, but he says, no, I love my master, I love my wife and my children, I want to be here. Something has changed with him. He chooses slavery again. And so he says, pierce my ear. I will be here for good. Now there is a parallel idea in the New Testament that pictures Christians as slaves. And I want to take this passage as sort of a beginning point to pursue that and to think in a deeper and better way about our own service to God. Because what we do is very similar to what we're describing here that we have been set free and we have the ability to walk away. And yet, we say, no, I want to be a slave. So in the New Testament, we are described as slaves to sin. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And then Paul writes in Titus 3, we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. So the idea here is, is not that we would, you know, occasionally we would do something wrong. That's the way we like to think about it. But the way the scripture describes it is that there is a relationship form where we don't really have any choice. We forfeited our choice, and now we must do what our bodies tell us to do. We're slaves to passions and pleasures. Whatever thought crosses our mind, whatever is going to please the flesh, that's going to be what we do. And so there is very little of this idea that, no, I am a, the master of my own destiny. Instead, we are slaves. And Jesus says that in a simpler form, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And yet, as you know, the gospel tells us that we are redeemed from slavery by the blood of Christ. Redeemed is a word that means to buy out of slavery or to set someone free. So 1 Peter 1.18, knowing that you were ransomed. Okay, get the idea of a ransom, something paid to set someone else free. You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, which is what you would typically set a slave free with, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So you were set free, you were redeemed. Or this is Revelation 5, 9. Worthy are you, sing to the lamb, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So... You get the picture here. I'm trying to set up the idea that the New Testament has a parallel image of slavery, freedom from slavery. And then the question, what do we do now? Now that we've been set free from slavery to sin, who do we serve? So I want to spend our time this morning looking through and thinking through this idea in Romans chapter 6. So if you would, get your Bible out, turn over to Romans 6. And we'll spend the rest of our time here uh, for this hour. Romans chapter 6. So the question then is, if we've been set free from sin, who would we serve? Why would we go back to slavery again? And particularly, why would we choose to serve a different master than the one we served before? So in Romans 6, the, the question that prompts the chapter, that prompts what's going to follow, is this question in Romans 6 and verse 1. Romans 6 and verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? So 
the, he has just finished talking about how as sin abounded, grace abounded more. As more sin came, Jesus conquering death, the defeated sin and made grace so that grace covered the sin. So his question is on a very practical level. Some seem to have been saying, well, we could just keep sinning because God can take care of it. God can just heap grace on top of it. Verse 2, by no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So, if we died to sin, he says, how can we live any longer in it? And he, he goes back through the process of how we were saved, where he talks about, you know, we died to sin, and we were buried with him through baptism into his death, and then we were raised to walk in new life. So that whole idea of death, burial, and resurrection, in which we picture Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, is intended to tell us something about what happens next. Because he says, you died to sin. And when you are buried in baptism, and you're raised to walk in newness of life, you don't go back to the way you used to live. That, that's just natural. You've died to that way of life, you have a new way of living. So he is stressing that baptism means death to sin. You don't go back to that because you are dead to that. So, once we have been set free from sin, if we're using the slavery image, which he's going to come to in a moment, once we've been set free from sin, who do we serve? We now have a choice. We've been set free, and we are sort of a free agent. Who do we serve now? And of course, there is the expectation that we would be set free to serve God instead of serving sin again. So he's saying, how can you go back to the thing that you died to. Verse 5, verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So we have a hope of a resurrection like his. He says in verse 5 that we died like him and we'll be united in a resurrection like his. But verse 6 says specifically the old self was crucified with him that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So now we're into slave language. This is how we were set free from that slavery. So, verse 8. Now, I'm sorry, verse 7. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So here is the, the thrust of these verses. I, I'm not going to go into detail into each one of these verses. I think the message is pretty clear. Jesus died, and now he lives or has that hope of a resurrection, or he gives us a hope of a resurrection like his. So Jesus died, he'll have a resurrection we die, we'll have a resurrection. That's the thrust of it. So, Jesus gains power over death, gives that power to us. All of this comes down to this, verse 11. Verse 11, so you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So, I want us to think through, now that we're, we've sort of set the foundation of where Paul is, we're going to move forward into verse 12. But the, the first thing that I want to see here is that if I am going to be a slave, then I need to think in this way. I belong to God is the first thing I want you to see here. I belong to God. Look at verse 12. Verse 12. Let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. So he encourages disciples to think of presenting themselves to God again. Like the slave who's been set free. Remember that slave? He says, no, I love my master. I love my wife and my children. I want to stay here. I want to go back. That's the slave that we are, where we say, I want to belong to you for good. And so we submit ourselves to him. I belong to God. And that word, look at verse 13. That word is present. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God. That word is a fascinating word, to present. I know it's kind of an, a dull word in English, but the word means to provide something or to put something at one's disposal. So it's used often in the New Testament to talk about something like giving troops or giving horses, 
providing something. Okay, here is something that now you can use. And so he says, you present yourselves to God. God, you can use me. I am your slave. I am at your disposal. I belong to you. And that necessarily means I don't belong to sin anymore. So he says in verse 14, if you look at verse 14, sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. So don't let sin reign, he says back in verse 12. This means that that relationship with sin has ended because I now belong to God. Pierce my ear. I belong to you. I'm yours. Verse 15. What then are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means do you not know that if you present yourselves, there's that word again, if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness. Don't you know, even if you say, I'm going to sin and God's going to get more glory because he gets more grace and all that, if you give yourself to obey someone, you belong to them. Whoever it is, you say, I'm going to obey you. You are theirs. And he is saying, if that's what you do to sin, then you're going back. So, I belong to God. These kinds of declarations, are one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this, I, I believe these kinds of declarations matter. I think it matters what we say, even if it's only in our heads, about the way we think about ourselves and our allegiances. And to say something like, I belong to someone. I believe that's the commitment we make when we get married. Where suddenly we think of ourselves in a different way. Sometimes we wear a ring that symbolizes that. Just, I, I, I don't know, it's not to remind us, right? Hopefully not. Hopefully we remember. But it's to say both to our spouse, to others, and yeah, I guess sometimes even to ourselves, I belong to someone. What, what do we mean by that? It's not a possession thing. I'm not someone else's property. That's not the idea. It means that I am reserved for them. That my affection and my devotion belong to my wife in a way that they don't belong to anyone else in the world. I am reserved for her. And that affects some things, doesn't it? When you start thinking in that way about yourself, it affects decisions that you make. It affects the way you spend your time. It affects the way you talk about yourself and about others. It affects the way you think. It affects the way you spend your money. I belong to her. Now, transfer that, all of that imagery, to the idea that our allegiance is now to God, where we say, I want to serve you. I present myself to you. I belong to you. What you offer me is what I want. I choose to be a slave. So... I belong to God. Think of yourself in this way. The second thing I want to see from this text is that my body is for righteousness. I think it's fascinating that a large part of our commitment in this section is based on what we do with our bodies. Okay, look at it with me again. Look back in verse 12. Romans 6 and verse 12. He says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions, your fleshly body. Okay. Isn't that interesting? To let it rain. It, it's almost as if, just in case, you know, I'm Paul. I use the word body in a lot of different ways. I talk about flesh and things like that. So let me just be clear. Your mortal body, this body of flesh that's going to die, that body. He says, don't let sin reign in it. Don't let sin take over. Don't use your body in service to sin. Then verse 13. Verse 13, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Isn't that interesting? In verse 13, he separates. You present yourself to God and present your members, that is the parts of your body, as instruments for righteousness. This is a body that you are going to use no longer for sin. And dabbling in sin, where you say, hey, let's have a little bit of sin, but then most of the time I'm going to do right. That is really presenting your body to serve sin again. It makes me violate this commitment that my body is presented for righteousness, no longer for evil. Look down at verse 19. Verse 19. It says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, 
leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So you once did it this way, where your body was an instrument of all kinds of evil things. That's what you used it for. Now, he says, you present it for something different. I want to remind you of a couple of places. You, you're familiar with these texts. But connect these with the idea of our bodies and what our bodies are to be used for. Romans 12 and verse 1, I have... Because your body is going to be either a conduit of sin or a conduit of righteousness. One or the other. You're going to serve something with your actual body. You've been bought out of your slavery. You now present yourself to do different things with your body. We've been set free. We've been bought with a price. And so there is a commitment expected from us. Give my body over to the purposes of God. This passage, I clicked away from it really quick, but this next passage just impressed me with how often The Bible describes sin as something that the body is used for in its sort of, uh, when the body is not used the way it was intended. And some of these are metaphorical. I don't think when he talks about feet that run to shed blood or something like that, feet that run toward evil, I don't think he literally means feet. But a lot of these things are literal. You know, the, the idea of using the tongue in an evil way, the idea of using the hands in an evil way to do evil things. Okay? These are ways that the body becomes a conduit for evil. And God wants our bodies to be used for good. I was thinking about this, and my mind went back to... God made our bodies. He knows what they can be used for, and he knows what they should be used for. And when God calls on us to use our bodies for righteousness, it's because he has a purpose and a design to the body. And the body is not for, for example, Paul says, sexual immorality, but for the Lord. So, what we're saying here is, 
eternal life. So to understand this next little section, we need to know that many ancient slaves were allowed to have their own money. Even though the master technically owned the money of the slave, the slaves were allowed to make money and use it to buy. He says, how did that work out for you when you didn't have to serve righteousness, when you used your body for whatever you wanted? How did that go? Were you happy with that? What fruit did you get? What wages did you earn? How much do you have to show for that time of your life? What was the benefit of that service? And I just want to say that is the answer to those who would object that Christianity is too restrictive. The question is, if you feel like you are freer outside of Christ... The question is, how does, how is that freedom going for you? Like, what do you have that you are proud of, that you have fruit that you can say, this is good because I am refusing to discipline myself or to use my body for good? What, I mean, what are, you, what are you pointing at that says, this is better than if I were serving Jesus? That's what Paul is asking. I believe that's the question that all of us should ask. The end of those things, he says, is death. So why would anybody ever choose to be a slave? Well, here you go, verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. So now you get real fruit, real benefits from your service. Now you get, in first, sanctification, the idea that you are made holy, that you are pure in a way you were not before. That as Christ lives in you, you become holier and holier, a different, better person, no longer ruled by sin. But then, that's just the now. Then you get the end result of sanctification, which is eternal life. Verse 23, he just says it plainly, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he states it simply, sin earns us death, but when we receive God's gift, when we serve God and go back into slavery again to serve him, we receive eternal life. So the first part of that, the idea that the wages of sin is, is death, In serving Jesus, the end we receive is eternal life. Now, eternal life is the promise that we're going to be with God forever. That we will be resurrected, that we will be free from judgment, and that as we have already been set free, we will be free forever. So, I want to take you back to that image we began with. You've got the slave who says, I love my master, I love my wife and my children, I will not go out. I want to be a slave. Pierce my ear. And so we say, I'm willing to be a slave because what I get in serving God is far better than what I get on my own. It's far better than the fruit I received before I was set free. So Paul lays out two paths here. You can see them. One is the path of slavery to sin. So it looks like freedom, but if you've walked down that road, and we all have, you know, it doesn't feel like freedom. It feels like a different kind of slavery. And he says, well, you don't feel good about what you've done. You don't have fruit. You're ashamed of those things. And he says, you don't receive good wages. Instead, what you get is the wages of sin is death. So down the end of that road is even more pain. And then there's another path. It 
is the path of slavery to righteousness. And it looks like presenting ourselves to God and our bodies to God to serve God. It leads to holiness and purity. It feels like we are serving a God we can trust and who will do good for us and do good in us. And at the end of that path is eternal life. So why would anybody choose to be a slave? That's why. It's because it's a better life when we're as servants of righteousness. So, I hope you'll take this picture, not this picture, but this picture of piercing my ear. And I hope you'll think about your service and your commitment to the Lord, how you use your body, and the hope that lies at the end of our journey. As that slave said, I will serve no other. I'm here to stay. Thank you for your attention. We'll be dismissed for our classes.